Hi. 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 Good morning. To Barcelona. Um, I wanted to talk uh, about one of the, for me, uh, one of the most important uh, subjects in your last book, which is that of beauty and intelligence, oh, yeah. you know, the facts. Oh, yes. and yeah. I remember myself, I was reading the book and I remember my, myself when I was a kid thinking, okay, Miriam, uh, you are not beautiful <laughs> or, you're, or, or you, you are not, you, you do, do not um, fit into the canon. Right, you know? right, right. But you are intelligent. You know? Yes, yes. And suddenly when I started to publish books, uh, someone said, she publishes because she's beautiful, no? And, <laughs> <laughs> and it was, yeah, it was terrible uh, to me because I thought, no, no, I was intelligent. I, I, right, I was of course, beauty, of no? course. Well, this is a fascinating business because it's very hard for the culture to accept the idea of an authority, an author of books, as you and I are, um, in a young, pretty package. Huh? So our ideas of perfect beauty, you know, one may not uh, reach that notion, you might not fit that notion, but I think almost all young fertile women, right? Women before menopause, women in their 20s and 30s and even 40s who uh, are attractive to uh, men or of course other women too, but mostly we're talking here about a male-female hierarchy, that accepting that person as an intelligent author worth reading is a huge problem in the culture. I think I was quite naive when I was first publishing too. I thought, well, you know, a book has no sex. There is the material on the page. It's there for everyone to read. I certainly do not write my books for men or women or people in between. I feel that they're written for the whole human race if they're able to read me and so it, w it was rather shocking for me to realize slowly and steadily over time that my appearance especially when I was younger was interfering yes. with reading my work mm -hmm. that's painful and it's also shocking when it comes to intellectual work, no? Not strictly fiction. No, uh, I mean, no. If, okay, you're, you're, a, you're a woman, you can be creative. Right, uh, yes. You can do poetry, you can be... Well, and especially if your books are about what people perceive as emotional or passionate subjects. Huh? Mm -hmm. But if you're treating what are often perceived as masculine frontiers, masculine uh, territory, then there are a couple of responses. One is to just diminish what you do, and the other um, is to get angry. I've felt a lot of anger directed at me, and um, it's an anger about my intellectual life um in in the in the blazing world uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah Harriet conceals her yeah. female identity um, behind um uh three males no she has, yes, she has yes. been ignored yes. for years no? right and suddenly um it, it's something that uh, a lot of writers uh, have done with fictional uh, names. Oh, absolutely. Um, writing under a pseudonym is a common business. And uh, George Eliot, a writer I love, published under George Eliot because she wanted to be taken seriously and uh, never wrote under her real name, Marian Evans. Uh, George Sand, two Georges, 
uh, uh, is another example. No, there are many examples of women who knew. Even um, uh, Rowling, the famous writer of uh, the children's books, she not only published under a male pseudonym for the Harry Potter books, but then chose a male pseudonym for a novel that she published later. This was clearly to masculinize her work, to take her out of what is perceived as a female ghetto. Mm -hmm. You also said in um, uh, The Woman Who Looks at a mm. Man Who Looks at, who looks at, Look at, at Women, woman, at women um, that uh, when, a, when a man opens a novel, he expects to find um, a man's name on the cover or uh, a male character, a male main, main character. Maybe uh, it's for, the, for this reason, no? For these emotional prejudice or... No, I think know. it's that they just don't want a woman's name outside. So uh, the same book with a man's name would have a different effect. So this is how we perceive, right? Part of reading, part of perceiving the world um, is that it's drenched with our ideas about how things are supposed to be. Uh, so I have found that the reason men avoid fiction by women is that in the first place fiction is perceived as an imaginary fluffy feminine thing. And if a woman's writing it then it's doubly feminized. Right, so when I give talks or do events for my novels, the audience is 80% women. When I'm giving lectures to psychiatrists, neurologists, or uh, neuroscientists, it's exactly the opposite. It's mostly men. And that's because those fields are dominated by men. It's also because if I'm talking about what is perceived as a masculine subject, I become more masculine, right? A woman neuroscientist has a more masculine status in the culture than um, a female novelist, but less status than a male neuroscientist, right? And this you feel. This is not, um, you know, I'm not talking out of my hat here. This is not simply a theoretical argument. It's something that I know. Another subject that I found interesting, one of the main, maybe the main subject in your book, is the construction, uh, the memory, how we uh, build our, ourselves, um, depending on what we have read, what we have lived. No? And you, you insert a paragraph of the Quixote, Yes. Uh, in the beginning <laughs> of the book. And it also made me thought about Madame Bovary. Yes. And all the, all the um, reference, no? the, the way our, um, our readings have shaped also Absolutely. our personality uh, That's as right. women, because we have mainly read um, uh, male authors. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. And absolutely. I think that the Quixote was absolutely intentional. Absolutely, and, and uh, uh, later an 18th century novel by a woman is mentioned, the female Quixote. Uh, so the part of the motion of the book is that this young woman uh, writer comes to New York City, as she says in the first sentence, looking for the hero of her first novel. And implicit in that is the idea of masculinity. Uh, and as the book goes on, She's trying to write a novel and failing at it, but there are two characters, a kind of Sherlock Holmes character and a Watson character. And that, the young woman who's playing the Watson part begins to take over this little novel that she's <laughs> failing to be able to write. And so the whole movement of, of the book is like that. But it is about how the books we love and care about have tremendous effects on our perception. So fortunately for this young narrator, she's a romantic. She's read a lot of romantic work. And so the ugliness of her apartment, the really pretty violent, dirty 
New York City is glazed with a Quixote <laughs> <laughs> coloring. I mean, she's just so happy. It's a romantic place for her despite the hardships of it. So that's part of how we make our way in the world. It might not be true strictly, you know, and she is hungry and then she invents another story to get her through the being hungry part of her life. So fictions can help us and they can also hurt us, mm -hmm. right? So in the very early first paragraph of the book, she says, what I know now that I didn't know then is while I wrote, I was also being written. Mm -hmm. So the writing of us is part of the cultural scripts that we're continually living. And among the deepest of those scripts are what femininity is and what masculinity is and how we become those. You know, I've been trying to emphasize in my academic work that it's not person and environment, right? There's not a line or a border. It's uh, that our s lives as social animals, right, with brains and guts and bodies, that these social parts of our lives, including the stories that we tell about ourselves to ourselves, become material, become our matter. They're built into us in, you know, the rhythms of the body, how we perceive patterns in the world, and emotional responses to it. I become very interested in the anger that I can provoke. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, one of the great liberations, I think, of my old self is that I can laugh about it. And one of the reasons is that I've understood it's not personal. It's just that I'm a woman. You know, I have breasts and a vagina and, 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 and this is enough to set people off because I'm also an intellectual. Mm -hmm. And my knowledge can either be warmly welcomed, by, by the way, by both uh, women and men, um, or it can be rejected because it's in the wrong body. Mm -hmm. I was thinking now about construction, also the construction of our, of our models, of our reference, has been also in, in a way conditioned by what mm, men wanted us to believe about, for example, Emily Dickinson in opposition to Walt Wiseman. No? For years yeah. we have thought that Emily Dickinson was um, in her house, uh, yes. Nothing. <laughs> <And> <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. So, so these panels. Uh, it's interesting about Dickinson because she published, I think, four poems dur during her lifetime, no more. And she did want to publish. We know that because she had a correspondence with Higginson that you probably have read. Um, I am, you know, she was uh, to use that word that I often don't like, but I'm going to use it. She was a genius and uh, she knew it. And there's one of my favorite lines is she writes to Higginson and he reads the work. He is an authority of the time, a literary great man. And he writes back to her that, well, he thinks that the meter is a little off and, and, and all of these things. And she writes back. <laughs> This is so beautiful. You think my gait spasmodic, sir, right? So you think the way I walk is, you know, like spastic. And then she says, I have no tribunal, yes. right? I have no court to justify me. But of course, she never changed her work. She carefully retained it. She knew. And her relative, not complete isolation, her self-imposed desire for solitude 
I think was in part, of course, to work, but also to be cushioned from the bruising reality of misogyny yes. that followed her later. You know, the real hatred of ambitious women. You know, what is this about? I mean, I keep on just like, like, what is it about? I think it has a lot to do with maternity. Whether women are mothers or not, we all come out of the body of a woman, something suppressed often in Western philosophy, right? That's where we start. And we are all profoundly dependent on a mother or someone to take the mother's place after we're born. And without that person, we die. In fact, we are much more helpless than most other mammals, right? I, I once saw a horse being born, a colt. It was amazing. It was a wonderful experience. And, you know, you see the colt yeah. sliding out of the maternal body. And a few minutes later, that little animal, is <laughs> first, it's at first it gets on its knees and then it stands up it's those these little thin shaking legs it is so beautiful but it, then it, it begins to move around and run around it is so independent very quickly human infants have to be carried around for a year basically um you know and, and and there are theories, they go back to the 19th century, that one of the reasons um, that human beings are so highly developed socially is that we're born early. And there's a beautiful phrase, it's not mine. There was a German biologist who talked about the first year of life as the extra uterine year. Isn't that what? and the baby is just plastered onto somebody that it needs. And so that dependence, I think, has shaped the discourse of misogyny to a very important degree. Uh, so that the all-powerful role of the mother in early life is then resented later so that any powerful woman reminds us, not just men, but men more intensely because of how masculinity is coded in the culture, of that dependence, of the omnipotent maternal role in early life, even though we don't remember it. We know it, we recognize it. And the uncomfortable question of borders, which is that you know, we all come out of the birth canal out of the vagina of, of, of a woman. <laughs> this is scary and creepy and, and, and uh, dependency in you know, the post-enlightenment culture is a really uh, uncomfortable subject, especially for men who think of themselves as self-made, right? You know, I gave birth to myself, you know, I made myself. This is the idea of genius in the culture too, that someone is just born and then makes himself, because it's usually himself, not and not, doesn't depend on anything, it's just there. It's like the soul, born with the genius soul and it's masculine. Mm -hmm. Another important subject I wanted to discuss with you, um, coming from your book, is the question of sexual sexual violence, um, violence yeah. Yeah. sexual um, uh, abuse. Um, last, uh, last year in, in Spain there was a multiple uh, rape um, and the, um, the answer uh, from women all around Spain was massive and in a way I think that this condition to the, the final sentence to the rapist it wasn't not as fair as I wanted but right. at least it was long and, and right and that made me made me thought about the 
the, the privilege uh, that men uh, have also in questions of justice uh, in governments. Yes. We have an example there. In yes. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, I think, you know, so the idea that women or the body of a woman is somehow open territory. I think this is what we're fighting, right? To establish the kind of boundaries that men usually feel between themselves and another equal male, right? Because we have to remember that misogyny is also often and maybe always linked to racism, to xenophobia, to the other, and that there are a lot of male victims of male sexual violence. And that the vulnerability is connected to that idea that the body of the other is somehow yours, that you have a right to it. Uh, in you know male-female hierarchies, this is the shock in the book. She says, it's as if she and her would-be ra rapist, he doesn't quite rape her, but he assaults her, um, are living in two different stories, right? Her story is that she's an independent being, and she tells him very pointed, pointedly and politely uh, to leave. And that's not his story. But the story is more subtle than that. It's that he wants to punish her. And why does he want to punish her? Because during the evening that they've spent together, she mentions first Marx <laughs> <laughs> and then Freud. Yes. And this makes him angry. So the irony of this story is two people pick each other up both of them expect to sleep with each other at the end of the night, right? She's attracted to him. She imagines his body naked. She's set to go. During the course of the evening, she gets turned off. Whatever she found attractive about this man has gone away. And rather than just fleeing, she accepts him taking her home. And then she blames herself over and over and over again for that acceptance. Until the older narrator is able to recode the story and say, no. He did it. You didn't do it. And part of her desire to say that it could have been different is because that gives her a little bit of power. And I think many victims do that. They'll say over and over, if only I'd done this, if only I'd done that. That's because it's a way of not giving up their will. Yeah. But the truth is that forms of sexual assault, whether they are very violent or just an intrusion, you know, we have to say they're different. It's worse when it's violent. But intrusions are also forms of punishment and humiliation most of the time. Because if a man misreads your signals and starts kissing you or, you know, smushing your breasts or whatever, and you say, oh, gee, you misunderstood me. I really don't want to have sex with you. I don't want to kiss you, whatever. It's over. Yes. It's when people get angry and want to punish. It's a form of punishment. And there are many reasons for that, either because I'm married to you and I own you, say, or uh, you made me angry because you seem to be quite independent, autonomous, free, and you are making me feel very unimportant. Mm -hmm. And I have to dominate you. And I have to dominate you for that reason. Even though there's nothing lost on the male side, right? Nothing is lost. His status is not compromised in any way. 
but the perception of the elevation of a woman or in racism of a brown or black person or the elevation of an immigrant outsider that is perceived as an assault a humiliation a form of emasculation in some people the important people that we're talking about here yeah okay thank you very much you're very welcome Sorry.